Hello and welcome to another episode of the Measured Golf Podcast. It's a new season with new guests and we are taking a slightly different approach on this episode and getting a little bit outside the world of golf equipment instruction and maybe how we think about playing the game. But in the spirit of how we play the game, we've got somebody on here to maybe help us better understand what the task is, what we're looking at, and how the world of golf course architecture actually works. And when it comes to golf course architecture, if you've been following along, there's a group called Clayton DeVries and Pont who's doing amazing work in this space, not only creating net new properties, but also doing restoration work across the globe. And none other than Mike DeVries, Michigan man, the pride of Michigan, I think actually, has decided to join us on the podcast and help the layman understand what makes a great hole of golf other than what score you made on it. So without further ado, we're very, very fortunate to have Mike DeVries. Mike, how are you doing this morning? Great to see you, buddy. Great. Yeah, thanks for having me. Look forward to this. Um, it's always always fun to learn about uh, another area of the golf industry or to impart knowledge, and um, that's always a good day, learning something new. Yeah. Well, I think you uh, you gave me a good segue there without trying, but impart knowledge. Um, I think that that is something that our industry sometimes misses just a little bit. And we were talking just before well, we actually have tried this a couple of times so far. And we've had some <laughs> Internet issues, but during the Internet issues and swearing, uh, we actually kind of talked a little bit. And something that I think is really cool, uh, Mike, about yourself um, is the story that you really I can't find anything about you that doesn't talk about you growing up at Crystal Downs and playing golf with your grandfather. And I think a lot of people your age or my age came to the game through our grandfathers, teaching us how to take our hats off and repair ball marks and rake bunkers. And like there was knowledge that was passed on. And I think a lot of that knowledge is probably not being transferred the way it used to be due to so many people learning from YouTube how to play golf which is a different experience, not wrong or just different. But what I think is crazy interesting is I don't think anybody really has ever passed on this information in terms of golf courses and what makes a great golf course to the masses. It's always been kind of a hush-hush secret, and I'm very interested to hear you kind of maybe expound upon a little bit of 101 basic level like, what, why, why don't we play golf in a, a cow pasture, right? Like there's a lot of land available there. Like, why don't you, like if somebody was to ask you that question from Mars, Mike, why don't we just play golf in cow pastures? What would be your answer? There's too many patties in the way. <laughs> oh, well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it'd be boring, right? Like nobody would come, right? Yeah, but it'd be, it, it wouldn't, you know, the, I think the key thing is to think about um, sometimes it's not only like, okay, this is how you're supposed to play the golf hole. But I, I talk about it in the way that I, I call it reactionary architecture, where we're reacting to what the site gives us. And every site's different. You know, it's not, this is not a tennis court. It's not, it's not X by X flat with a three foot net. And, you know, you hit a ball over and you got fencing around. It's, it's not the same every time. So all those properties are really, really different from a mountain course to a lynx course. Um, you think about St. Andrews, it's basically flat, but it's really Very. being up and down here and there. And when you have a flat piece of ground and you have a little bit of movement, you know, one foot or a foot and a half, two feet, that seems like a lot. That feels like a lot. If you got a big mountainous course and you move two feet, it, it does, it looks flat. <laughs> so it's, um, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a big variety there and you have to adapt things. Um, to the golf course to try and create something interesting. And the key thing for me is that we want to find ways to engage golfers uh, because not every golfer is the same either, right? You, your site's not the same. Your player's not the same. They're not doing exactly the same thing. And so, and as good as, you know, the best players are, they try and do a particular shot to get to a particular position to have the best shot to, you know, get closer to the pin, et cetera. But how many times do we actually execute that shot just perfectly to get to where we want? And so whatever error we have on that shot, now we have to adjust and then figure out, well, what's what's my best opportunity for the next one? So we're, we have to 
right? When you think about that, like the golfer has to adjust and we need to find a way to make them engaged. So if they miss their target and they land in a bunker or something, is that bunker engaging or does it say, hey, I have a very, very small chance of hitting the green or it's like, I have no chance, just get it out, you know? And then what's the ego of the golfer? Are they like, oh no, I can do this. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> you know, three three shots later in the bunker, they're like, Rah! screaming at themselves and, you know, dropping four right. bombs and everything. So I think, you know, that's the thing that's cool about it is how can you make golf continuously interesting? How do you make it where someone is trying to find the solution, but that solution's individual for them. And um, it happens a lot of times when we go to like an existing course and, and you're, you know, I, there's a lot of times I've been to a place, never been to the golf course before. I'll walk the golf course in the morning, usually like with the superintendent, because they know everything that's kind of going on on the golf course, just from a, um, you know, economy basis. Yeah. And like, you know, Hey, there's piping here. There's just that here, stuff like that. And they, they get, um, you know, they have the opportunity to tell me things that, you know, give me answers about certain questions. And then we'll go into a meeting at noon and some, I'll say something about the left side of the seventh hole or the right side of the 15 or, and there's invariably someone who's been there their entire life and they'll be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> because they're not looking at what I'm looking at, you know? Right. And that bunker or feature or whatever maybe doesn't apply to them or very infrequently, right? But so we, about all that's those- really interesting though, because like you kind of have been dancing around it, right? But it's you're trying to make something that's challenging for somebody who's a skilled golfer right and and interesting right engaging like if it's not engaging like a good player gets bored pretty quick like it doesn't matter the golf course so it's got to be able to be played in different ways it's got to be engaging it's got to be challenging but then if mrs haverkamp comes out to play golf you know what i mean like she's got to still be able to get it around the golf course in a way that works for her but isn't so hard to where she never wants to play golf again so, I mean, it's it's kind of an interesting challenge, I think, for the architect to create that, because like you said, also, you know, that's easy to do in a CAD program. Like you can just make random holes all day long that are fun and interesting and exciting. But if you take that CAD rendering out to a site <laughs> and the site, it doesn't fit, you know, that's not going to work most of the time. The only time I think something like that maybe that I'm aware of anyway has happened is maybe like a whistling straights to where it seems like that thing was just dead as a, do- as a doorknob flat. Right. And they just said, Hey, this is what we want. And they built it. <laughs> so, I mean, well, like it's kind of, yeah, that's, well, it's interesting you bring that up. Cause, um, cause you know, that was one of Pete dies, you know, great works and stuff and they've held all these championships and, you know, it's a very successful resort and all that. And there, there's, you know, this Whistling Straits Irish course and then the two courses at Black Wolf Run um, that are all really part of the same. They're not immediately next to each other, but they're very close in proximity. So, you know, it's it's a four course um, resort, really, essentially. And um, Pete, you know, he he was the master of, you know, being on site and doing stuff and waving his arms and changing things. So he had a concept, but then he's like, we need more dirt. Just keep bringing the trucks. I'll tell you when to stop, <laughs> you know? So, so, um, yeah, he, yeah, he, you know, that's, um, I never worked for Pete and I only met him, you know, briefly, um, didn't really spend time with him or learn about what he did, but, you know, he was on equipment. He was out there with boots on the ground every day. He wasn't, you know, behind the desk, just drawing something. Um, it was more about building it in the field and that's what, um, Bill Coor, Tom Doak, Bobby Weed, those guys learned, and they've passed that on. You know, I worked with with Tom Doak 35 years ago. So, um, you know, that sort of emphasis on building it in the field and adjusting things, because even really good topo maps, there's stuff in the in between those that you just don't quite see. Well, the and- thing that's that's crazy, right? And like this is like maybe whistling is a good example, right? Cause I would say that's like extreme architecture of a golf course. Right. Yeah. So like, I think the thing that's so interesting is we were there for the Ryder cup. 
Uh, and I've, I mean, I literally walked my butt off, man. I mean, you know how that place is. It's, it's up and down. There's not a flat spot on it. And like you get to where you're, I don't know, 45, 50 yards away from the green. You're nowhere near where anybody's ever going to play golf, right? Like, I mean, Mrs. Havercamp might find that place every now and then. But I mean, like, you're legitimately not going to find that spot on the golf course. And there's like all of this intricate, like spider web bunkering kind of stuff. And it doesn't look like anybody would have done that intentionally, but you know, they did. And like, it's so cool how there is just a very chaotic, natural nature made this feel about a place that is more or less kind of completely manufactured. It's just, it's mind boggling for me that doesn't understand the field nearly as well as you do to see things like that, that appear so natural. And we know that they're actually man-made like, I really think it's a tip of the cap to how much better the architecture is getting. And it's so much less Mickey Mouse now, I feel like, and neighborhood, like, lot selling driven. And it's really getting back into taking a piece of property and trying to, like, accentuate it versus try to create something net new that kind of overtakes the actual property. Like, it's really cool, man. I think it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And there's certainly... um development real estate development has driven a lot of things for a long time and right. still is in in certain situations um golf's a business and you got to figure out how to you know pay for the shaping and and the green keeping and all that sort of stuff so um it, it is a, <laughs> there's sort of a two-edged sword sometimes um you know i grew up at crystal downs and it's one of the great places in the world and that was a real estate development walkley ewing the founder um, got into development, um, and he just remembers when he was a kid walking the eastern shore of Lake Michigan with his brother all along one summer. They spent like three or four weeks, and they walked from Muskegon all the way up to Mackinac, and he remembers these two farms on this hill and overlooking Crystal Lake and, and Lake Michigan where Sleeping Bear Sand Dunes and the Manitou Islands are. And, you know, he went back there in the mid-20s, and it's like, Mm, wow this place would be great i could sell homes here <laughs> and you think about the 16th hole there's it sits inland and then there's a row of cottages that are on the edge of the bluff well what if what if the golf hole had been there how cool would that been you know you would you know it's a great hole already but it could have been even cooler right so um you know who, who knows i mean it's um there, there's a purpose for all of it and every canvas is different. So, you know, we're lucky we get to, we get to play in the dirt and see stuff evolve and, you know, make things better. And, and, you know, hopefully, you know, long past, you know, our time being here, there's going to be other people enjoying it. That's kind of a, that's a really cool thing. Yeah. I think that's, that's really, that's what's cool, man, is, is you know, I think something that's hard to do is to, you know, last pass, you know, when you, when you pass away, right? Like, how do you have a legacy? And I think what's really cool is we, we were very fortunate. We met at the 150th open, I believe at the CDP slash sounder party, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, and luckily I, I, I don't know what it is. I still think this is true. You and David are related, David Adele, like you two are so comically like americana it's unreal like you guys just are exactly what you would think of it's just very very weird but i remember talking to you and i just i've always had this admiration for like this purity of whatever it is you do like i don't care what you do just i want you to try to be the best at it that you can and like listening to you talk about holes of golf and golf course architecture and like there's there's always kind of like this, I don't feel like you just go, well, I could build you the coolest hole ever and show you this amazing thing. And like, I'm not trying to disparage it, but I could give you Shadow Creek. Like I could do that, but I'd rather like take something that's there and tweak it a little bit and get you to think about it slightly different and make it more playable and enjoyable and get rid of all the crap in the way that doesn't make any sense. Like, dude, that sounds to me like we're actually going back to playing golf again. Like, I mean, I just... It's gotten, I've been very fortunate, been able to travel a bit and played more golf in the UK. And honestly, I, I think golf in the UK is spectacular and sublime in so many ways, not just Scotland. I think Scotland's great, 
But then you go over to the UK where the Addington is, which is a, a project that you're part of. And I mean, like that, that's totally different than Scotland, but also very similar in ways. And it's just, it's really interesting to me how golf courses, when you play these golf courses that kind of are a little bit different and not so tucked into a neighborhood and whatnot, that there's like a feel of home. There's a feel of sustainability. There's a feel of the spirit of the game, maybe call it what you will. But like, it's just, there's a very real golf experience. And I know that you get that at the Addington. I know you get that at Kingsley. I'm sure you get that at Crystal Dan They're like, it's just a different thing, man. And I, I think that what you guys are trying to do at CDP is just very interesting because I don't think you guys are trying to make as many golf courses as you can. I think you're probably picking and choosing projects where you think you can make a difference. And that's just a lot different way of doing it. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, I, I mean, I've been in golf my whole life. That's really all I've ever done. And, yeah. uh, you know, I've been, um, you know, starting from, you know, just learning the game from my grandparents and my uncle and then working at, you know, in the bag room for Fred at Crystal Downs and then going to the grounds crew and, you know, mowing greens and cutting cups and raking bunkers and doing all that kind of stuff and just evolving in the game and finishing college and trying to figure out what I was going to do, did something else and figured out that wasn't my mission, went got back into golf and, you know, then met, then met Tom Doak and, um, worked with him for about two and a half plus years and um, then we didn't have another project and so it it ultimately ended up where you know I've you know learned from a lot of different people in a lot of different ways about golf from learning the swing from Fred and working in the pro shop and how you know the pro shop works and what that atmosphere is and you know how do you service people and how do you you know it's just it's a great thing about golf the industry doesn't do that it doesn't it teaches us manners and and the way to do things properly and stuff like that so if you're working in the bag room or you're a caddy it's like hello mr smith nice to meet like nice to meet you and you know you make a you know a firm handshake you look him in the eye stuff like that you don't get that in a lot of things nowadays it's like where's my device how do i com you know communicate you know like communicate with the person directly one-on-one -on -one. Right. That, that's really good um, so there's all these things that, that the industry does. Um, and then it have affords, you been to Augusta, Mike? Uh, I haven't played it, but I've, I've, yeah, I've been to a practice round, you know, at the tournament and stuff like that. And, okay, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. So here's something I want to throw this at you. I think people miss why Augusta is so great. And I'm, I'm not even I'm not going to get into the golf course. <laughs> I'm not even going to do that. Right. Okay. <laughs> but I think that people totally miss why Augusta National is so great. I really do. And here's what I think. And I, I don't think I've said this before, and I'm excited to actually get to say this because I, I think it's true and I haven't heard anybody else say it. You know the big sitting areas over by the merch tent by the range? Over yeah. underneath all the trees where the telephones are and everything? It's a mm -hmm. huge area, right? When is that area not packed? It's always packed. It, there's yeah. always people sitting there, right? There's always people around all the concessions sitting. They make a nice, they do a nice job of providing just enough seating to eat your pimento cheese and move on. Right. Yep. So like there's never an abundance of seating, but there's always a seat when you need one. However, you have to ask somebody to sit at the table because they're not all little two tops and four tops. They're big tables. Right. Yeah. And that's something that young people don't do anymore. You would never walk up to a crowded table and go, hey, can we sit and join you? Very common in Europe. Not so yeah. common in the United States. Yeah. But then you sit down at a table with strangers and you don't have a phone to make a fake call with. You can't blow people off. And, dude, people hate silence. Like, human beings, of all the things they can't handle anymore is silence. And, like, you start talking. And, like, that's the thing that makes Augusta great is, like, it forces you to be a human again instead of trying to communicate through a phone all the time. I mean, yeah. it's magic. Like, you feel so much better when you leave Augusta probably because you feel like a human being again because you've been talking to people yeah yeah communication it's an amazing thing right like you can't avoid that person and it's it's like when you sit down in the plane and you're next to somebody how's your day going it might just be super brief you know and sometimes you sit there and you talk to the person for a half an hour like right. you, just, you know you know it just you don't know i mean 
you're put into situations where you have to be a human again. And that's a really good, yeah. And the thing that Augusta, yeah, it, my brother was, my brother's not a golfer. And, and he had a friend that was going down to Augusta. This is like 20 years ago. And he calls me up, he goes, Chuck's asked me to go down, you know, and I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, the masters, you know, but it's, it's golf. It's your thing. <laughs> and I'm like, we'll go, you're going to, yeah. you know, like the best run event in the world. It is like, not just golf. No, I go, you can't have your phone. He's like, I can't have my phone. What do you mean? I can't have my phone. I'm like, can't have a phone on site. Yep. So can't do that. Um, you know, you can't run, you can't, you know, it's, and like everything is in place. I'm Perfect. telling you, eat off of the bathroom floor. And, you know, he got back and he was like, that was unbelievable. I couldn't, it was like, it was just like you said, it was awesome. Like, I think, I think they were using like toenail clippers to like trim, <laughs> trim the grass. He's like, you know, he was all these superlatives. And he's like, and you know what? The import beer was, was only $3. <laughs> he was like, I got the imported, <laughs> you know? So it was like, um you know just everything is like super well done there and there's this um there's this energy there that um imparts everything that's good about golf and you get to see these great players and hit great shots uh, we will talk about the golf course a little bit you know the greens are phenomenal and and you know they're hitting these shots that you know move like the second hole when the guy's hitting a four wood in or something and you know, it's, wood. when's the last time you watched Augusta? <laughs> well, you know, I'm going back a ways. I, I still like to live in the past. So, <laughs> I still like to live in the past. You know, they're hitting a long, they're hitting a longer shot in, and it hits that front left yeah. and rolls all the way back to the right corner. I mean, that's just really cool, right? And you don't see that on the normal PGA telecast. No, so, it's uh, a different presentation of golf for sure, and it, yeah. it's, you know, they do a really nice job. I think. They've, de they've definitely done the best job of kind of keeping who they are at the core of what they are while also trying to evolve. And, you know, it's it's golf. Golf doesn't evolve very quickly, uh, which is probably a good thing in a lot of cases. But, you know, I, my, as, as many things as Augusta does right, they seem to be finding a way to do more things right year over year. And it is, it's exactly like you said, if you, I, I'm very fortunate have been every year since 2019 and it's just unflipping real at how well run it is. You, you might be in a line, but the line never stops moving, you know? It, and like you said, like the bat, you can't imagine how clean the bathrooms are. It's unreal. Like all day, yeah. every day, like perfectly yeah. spotless. It's unreal. Um, but the thing that the golf course does is I think, what Augusta does really well is it kind of makes you just a little uncomfortable from the course perspective. And I think the thing that's so amazing is of course the, the design is great. The, the, the way it's presented is immaculate. Always it's truly phenomenal what they do at the ground level. But I think personally, what makes Augusta special is the fact that you have those tall pines and you basically just have nothing but shoots on the side of a mountain to catch the wind. And like, that's the thing that I think is really missed maybe a little bit at Augusta National is what makes 12 so hard is not the shot itself. It's the fact that you have 11 coming in, you have 13 coming in, they're both shoots straight downhill, and then there's a wall behind 12 that they have to walk up to get to 15 T. And all that wind converges and creates this cyclone right above Ray's Creek. Yeah. And then the problem is, is now all of a sudden, like, how does that golf ball hit that kind of tornado is how it's going to work out, which is why Tiger is always aiming at the left side of that green, because he knows that cyclone works this way. And if he gets it into the left side of that cyclone, it's going to shoot it towards the middle of the green versus hitting that cyclone head on where it shoots it down into the creek like you see a lot of players do. So, I mean, it's just, I think, like, when I see that and I see that they know that the wind is being used as part of the, like, that just seems like very smart design to me. And it seems like one of those places to where there's not one single thing that hasn't been thought about. And it's with the sub air and everything, like, it's just the place is really dialed in 
and you don't get that same experience, like you said, at any other event in the world. It's unreal. I mean, I haven't been to Monaco. I've heard Monaco is pretty impressive, but it can't be as well run as the Augusta National Golf Tournament. Yeah, I, it's, I haven't been to, yeah, I, haven't, well, I mean, I've been through Monaco, but not there for the race or anything like that. So all the beautiful people, you know, a so. lot, a lot of beautiful people, a lot of boats, a lot of, a lot of money. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. But you know. no, it, it's, um, yeah, it is, it, you know, it's phenomenal. And, you know, being in the Northern hemisphere here, it's the beginning of the golf season, really, you know, being in Michigan and, you know, if you have a long winter and it's still sort of dreary in early April, it's kind of like you're getting fired up because the Masters is on, you know? Yeah, man, it's, it's the that, kickoff like, to golf season. He's, you know, that that was like sitting there and seeing the, you know, Jack coming down the back nine, you know, on Sunday. And, you know, is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? Yeah, he's going to do it. You know, <laughs> so, like, you know, it was always it was always an event. It was, yeah. it was really cool. So. I mean, it's, it's just, a, it's a, it's so cool how it's, it's kind of like, you know, I live in Ann Arbor and you're a Michigan guy too. And if you live in Michigan, like Thanksgiving is a Detroit lions holiday, right? Like it just is living in yep. Michigan. Yep. Um, and it's, it's kind of cool that Michiganders have that tradition and it's, it's really cool. But like, to your point, you know, Michigan has that thing, but like the whole world has Augusta national, right? Like that is, basically the kickoff to golf season for the United States. And for most of the people uh, that are big diehard golfers, it's just to your point, man, it's, it's become this American tradition. I think that the tournament by and large is more about families coming together than it is even about the tournament anymore, because so many people get together with their family to watch it because they've done that from the beginning of, you know, their life. So yeah, I just think it's mega cool. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I do want to ask you about something because I do have a favorite golf course that I've played. I can't tell you why it's my favorite golf course, but Kingsley club, I think is just something that's really not what you would ever expect a golf course to be. And it's just really a cool property. You know, it's, it just really hits at a lot of things that I hold near and dear to my heart because I am very much a public golfer. So I know that, that you've shared that you grew up at Crystal Downs and I'm sure that I just can't even imagine what that would be like, because to your point, you're around excellence all the time. And like that just becomes the standard quota. But I actually come from more of a public background and like Kingsley Club, even though it's a private club, makes you feel like it doesn't matter. Like if you can get on the property, here's the golf course and can you do it? And man, I really like that. I think it's so cool. The nuts and bolts, like just this is a golfer's dream. And I'm just really curious to kind of maybe have you share a little bit about how I'm sure that had to be wild, man. Like you, you're a Michigan guy. You get this phone call like, hey, we want to do this. mega. I'm sure it sounded pretty mega cool from the jump or you wouldn't have been on board. But like just like not necessarily talking about what you did at the club at first but maybe talking about like getting the phone call and what that was like and kind of what your initial thoughts were and maybe, maybe what your original vision for this project was and maybe it changed. So I just kind of would be interested to hear a little bit about that. Cause that had to be kind of a cool moment in your career if I had to guess. Yeah. Well, so I'd done pilgrims run North of Grand Rapids. Um, and that was a really unusual project. Um, Cause there were six guys that quote, quote you know, co-designed three holes a piece and they were involved in various ways some of them were you know casual golfers some of them were really hardcore golfers and they all worked for mr van campen um which is the van campen mutual funds and they had this big property and they um they said well let's build this golf course you know and it would be for us and clients and people that come in and you know and it would be a cool exercise that's what mr van campen you know sort of looked at it as and um so that was really very different and then um, back to Fred Muller, my old boss at Crystal Downs. Um, he, uh, was friends with Art Preston, who was one of the members at the Downs and knew, uh, Ed Walker, who was a business associate of, of arts. They had done, they were oil and gas exploration guys here in Michigan, um, down in, down in Texas, et cetera, and all that. So 
they had known each other for a number of years and they're both big golfers and they wanted to, you know, develop their own club. And so, um, Fred said, Hey, I, you know, I want you to meet, you know, Ed Walker and, you know, why don't you come over? And we, <laughs> we literally like got a bottle of wine out and, you know, and, and Ed sort of basically said, you know, Hey, we want to build this great golf course. You know, we're not worried. We don't want to do development. We don't want to do any of that. We want to build a great course. And, um, you know, I found this piece of land. I don't know if this is the land that's going to work. And if it's not, we'll find the right piece of land. But, um, so, um, that's kind of how the whole thing started. And philosophically, you know, I didn't, I didn't know Ed. So, you know, and Fred's vouching for me. He's known me, you know, <laughs> for, for 15 years or something at that time. And, you know, um, that was a, that was a big, um, you know, it was a big commitment for him and for Ed and Art to, you know, put that in my hands and, you know, give them credit. They let me do what I needed to do. And they were involved, but they weren't saying, oh, we should have a bunker here and a bunker there or whatever and all that. They were, they were more about, you know, they were buying into the whole thing. And that, the sort of, the golf course evolved as we got to know the land better and what it could be and how should it play. And, um, you know, we really, you know, they love Irish golf and, you know, British Isles golf where the ball's running and all that. And so the way to do that is to do it with fescue and fescue grows great in Northern Michigan. So, and we have amazing soils there, glacial till that just drains freely. So, um, we also got, so, you know, they committed to kind of doing that. And if that wasn't going to end up being the way they wanted, we could always oversee bent grass in there and, you know, have the typical bent grass fairway and stuff like that. So, um, you know, that it was the decision to move things sort of in that direction, to keep that and to establish those types of things. Did with- you like in this meeting, like, I'm just curious, like, so there was a point where you kind of were probably told, okay, it's, it's your project, right? Like you just walk out to your car after that and just go, holy shit. Or like, how, how does, like, how do you, I mean, the scope of one of these golf courses, man, like I just sit there and once again, I'm, I'm not trained in this field. So maybe that's why it seems so overwhelming to me, but it would just seem to me like if I was you and they were like, Hey man, we believe in you. We're going to buy in. We're going to do this thing that you want to do on this land. Like that would just seem like this monumental undertaking for somebody like yourself, that's kind of more or less the point man to start this thing. You know what I mean? It's, it's just, holy crap, that's got to be wild. <laughs> yeah, well, it wasn't quite that definitive. It wasn't that simple, like, oh, you got the job, bing, bing. It's like, okay, we're going to go with you and we're going to figure this out. And, and but, you know, if we get six months down the road and we can't figure out the problem and this, this isn't the right piece of ground, we're going to find the right piece of ground, you know? So, yeah, there was that commitment and that was like, you know, wholeheartedly I could, you know, go into it and like, this is, it's 25 minutes max from my house. So, you know, that isn't going to happen again. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say, man, that's pretty rare. I would think. Yeah. Yeah. I'm either like right next to home or I'm halfway around the world in Tasmania. So, um, which is literally halfway around the world from where I'm at. So, 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 you know, it is interesting how projects are always different. I mean, um, and I think it is, you know, sometimes, you know, you find something and something clicks in really quickly and sometimes it takes a while for it to sort of, how was, so was Kingsley the right piece of property from the jump? Was that, was that the course they, or the yeah, land that, that they that was, that, that was just, yeah, that was the property that Ed, Ed had, he, he saw yeah, this is when he had ads in the paper. He saw he saw it's 320 acres, um, you know, for sale, and you know he and um, <clears throat> his Karen, excuse me, his wife, went down like one Sunday afternoon after they saw it in the paper Sunday morning, and like, wow, this is pretty good. And it was all it had all been clear cut like 15 years before, so it was a thicket. I mean, there was a trail going through there, but that was it couldn't see anything you couldn't see in places you couldn't see 10 or 20 feet into the bush i mean it was just it was so are you purely looking at like topography 
like if it's covered right with trees and, and, and thicket yeah. and whatnot, are you like when you're assessing a piece of property, are you kind of purely looking at topography and then kind of clearing from there? Or are you kind of trying to clear where you think some holes would be and kind of looking at it more that way? It's all of that. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing as much as you can anywhere. But yeah, no, we had a we had a topo map. Um, and there's about 105 feet of elevation on here. And the ground is, you know, it's heaving and moving and doing all different kinds of stuff. So you could get a sense of where things were. And um, Ed, you know, the land was really cheap because they had sort of raped and pillaged the, the, the timber off of it. So, you know, you weren't going to get any money off of, you know, lumbering it or anything. So it was just kind of raw ground. And, and he said, well, if the golf course doesn't work here, you know, this is great pheasant hunting because, you know, you're flushing a bird every 25 feet. Um, so, so, you know, he was looking at it kind of like that, um, that, you know, it was an investment and, and, um, you know, he could do something else with it maybe. So, um, so by the way, I hope we never hunt pheasants there because that place is meant <laughs> to be a golf course, brother. <laughs> like, <laughs> Well, funny story. We were actually during construction and we were, Ed was giving some people a tour and I was, so he picked me up and I was on the dozer and, and it, we're, we're driving around. He's showing them the other land and it's, it's hunting season. So, and the dog's in his lab is in, the, you know, his hunting lab is in the car with us. And he, he sees, <laughs> we're going around this trail and he sees some pulls out the shotgun <laughs> birds flush, bam, he hits one. The dog doesn't want to go chase it. So Ed goes out there in his suit <laughs> takes the bird throws it in the back and of course the birds it's dead but you know there's this reactionary thing and all of a sudden the bird goes <laughs> in, the back, in the back of the suburban you know it just about freaks these guys right out i, I was freaked out too <laughs> it was it was hilarious but he's like winston go, you know winston's just sitting there he's like i don't want to go chase it you know he just like, good bird it was i, I it was very humorous <laughs> for me <laughs> great so great, great time so so we got this amazing property at the kingsley club i mean you've got projects in tasmania i mean i'm not somebody in the know as much as other people would be but it seems to me like all signs point to who cape wickham links being maybe one of the better golf courses that you can actually play globally is that is that the reception that you guys are seeing down there? Because it sure seems like that's the reception that's getting online. Uh, yeah, it is. So ever it's it's been open since 2015, um, late 2015, and it's uh, it's always been in the, you know, that they have Golf Australia and Australian Golf Digest. Those are kind of like the Australian versions of golf and golf mag, you know, golf magazine and golf digest magazine. Um, and so they've been in their, you know, their rankings have been in the top two, three, um, ever since it really opened. Um, the amazing thing is a few months ago, Australian Golf Digest came out with their new ranking. You know, they do every other year. And Royal Melbourne West is always the number one course. Only one time, I think, in the last 40 years did it. It was a really bad drought, and they'd had a bunch of stuff going on or, or something was happening. And it dropped to number two um, behind Kingston Heath, probably just because, you know, there was a conditioning thing or something that happened. I don't know. Um, but um, it came out this year and Wickham was number one. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, that no, that's what I said. I was like, Plates had sent me a, a text with the cover and I'm like, you know, new number one. I'm like, what? <laughs> that can't be. It's Royal Melbourne. <laughs> so. <laughs> So, um, and, and it was in, there was a, there was another, um, Australian golf passport, which is a, a podcast. These two guys do Scott and Matt and, um, and they had the guy on there that wrote the article and he, that guy has, I can't remember his name offhand, but he, um, he's written for both golf Australia and Australian golf digest for the last 20 plus years um doing articles and you know editor and things like that and he was on there gave a very objective thing about how they do it and and royal melbourne didn't like it didn't necessarily drop in its standing i mean its scores were consistent 
Wickham just jumped up this last time. Um, and they, they sort of explained it real objectively. It was, it was very interesting because these, these golf ratings are a very emotional thing for people. I've seen, Oh, we're number one. We're not, you know, we dropped three spots. We're now we're 13 instead of 10 or, you know, and like it's in a fin, you know, in the infinitesimal little, you know, data points is really what the difference is. And if you think about courses and you just, there's courses that are in the same class that, you know, that belong there. And you could make the argument that I like this one better than that one for whatever reason. Um, but Wickham is a, it's a very special place. It's oceanfront dunes and, you know, it's a very diverse piece of property. Um, it's remote yet it's only a 40 minute flight from Melbourne. It's not, you know, it's in the middle of the Bass Strait on a small Island, but it is, um, you can get there pretty easily. So, um, you know, it, it's, uh, if you're in Australia, it's easier to get there than it is to get to Bandon, you know, like <laughs> Bandon is difficult to get Bandon to. Bandon is difficult. Bandon it, is very tough. It's very worth it. Um, you know, and everybody should go because I mean, it's a phenomenal thing, but, um, so I just had my business partner uh, in my facility, like, reach out to me. And he was like, hey, man, we, uh, we're overdue for a golf trip. Where do you want to go? And, like, he's had a really good year uh, on his side of the equation. And he's like, literally pick where you want to go. And obviously the, an the answer is Bandon. Like, I want to go to Bandon. So he's like, all right, we'll call Bandon, set it up, and we'll go. So I called Bandon, dude. You, I think, until 2025 – the i'm sorry until the end of 2025 you can only book two days like that's the most you can get you can only <laughs> go out for two days and like go yeah. off your brains out but like they ain't yeah. got room for you so it's two days max and then you're done and it's just like you look and and it's it's hard right like you you said it very well earlier right like it is a business like we talk from a place of emotional like beings and like passion but at the end of the day it is a business and you look at like how much a place like Bandon cost when you when you finally like total everything up. And it's like, man, it's it's really, really expensive and it's really, really difficult to get to. But to your point, man, I mean, we're seeing golf course architecture now to where it's really worth going to. You know, I think it's it's really amazing the experiences that you can have at some of these courses. Like when I was, you know, looking up some stuff for this podcast so that I was a little more well versed you know, golf porn, like that should be synonymous with CDP. Cause if you go to CDP's website and start looking at the golf courses, you guys do, I mean, you're talking about some of maybe the most beautiful places on the planet. And like the, the property that we're talking about, uh, Cape Wickham, uh, in Tasmania, I mean, Holy smokes, man. I mean, it would be hard to stand there at sunset and not think you're looking at the prettiest thing in the world, I think. So, I mean, it's just a testament to, how amazing golf is and what you guys are able to accentuate that nature already does. And that's where I think it's really different. The projects that we're talking about and what you do, it's more about letting the actual, the actual land shine than it is trying to make it something that it isn't. And I, I think that's really cool, man. Cause like you look at Cape Wickham and like, I don't know what's great about that. I'm getting ready to ask you, but like, you can tell that that is a golf course that you're going to have a great time playing golf. Like you can just tell, it doesn't matter what you shoot. You're going to go out there. You're going to get challenged. You're going to hit some good shots. You're going to hit some shots that you don't get rewarded for, but man, like that's golf. But what I'm curious about is I get that feel, but now I want you to nuts and bolts this thing for me and tell me how or what Cape Wickham has from a architectural standpoint that makes it stand out? Like what makes that place actually great? That's actually in the design that maybe we don't understand. Well, the sites, the sites really very different than any other sort of coastal site. Usually, um, you know, when you think about Lynx golf and the holes that are like on the ocean, they have the very, they have a very similar, um, you know, environmental sort of standpoint. So if you're at deal, it's, you know, there's a, there's an actual seawall, um, but you know, it's low dunes and, you know, you're on the ocean, like in that way, like we talked about St. Andrews already, it's flat, you know, you don't really see the ocean. You get out to Eden and you're like, you get a little glimpse of the river Eden and stuff, but 
you don't really have that much relationship. So you're not right on the water like you are with with um, the new or, you know, Jubilee when you get over there and stuff and you get a little glimpse of stuff. Um, you certainly do from, say, you know, one T, you look over, you know, from there, but it's you're not right on it. It's not that visceral. Um, Pebble Beach is, you know, all cliffs, you know. They're short cliffs, really, you know, and then a little higher cliffs, but it's all cliffs. And that's a very that's a jagged edge, which is a little different than a lot of places. Um, Wickham has all of that. It's got, it's got, it's got big, you know, 60 foot cliffs. Um, It's got Victoria Cove at the 18th hole, which is a sandy, you know, North facing. So sun receiving in the Southern hemisphere. Um, you know, it's like the Blue Lagoon down there. Like, you know, all you need is Brooke Shields down there. <laughs> okay, here, you know, we're in a movie set. I mean, it's, your references you know, are like really current. I really like <laughs> your references. They're so current. <laughs> <laughs> there are some guys that'll get that. Yeah, um, there are. So, Luckily, I do because I remember that movie very well <laughs> for very obvious reasons. <laughs> uh, the uh, the uh, the eleventh hole is like practically in the ocean. You know, waves are just lapping up right, right on you're right on the shore, and so it's very different in how you interact with the ocean there, um, because you're looking at it different ways, or you're experiencing it from a different elevation, or viscerally, you know, you're feeling the the har or whatever, however they say that in Scotland. You know, that's kind of, it's rolling in and this and that, and so you're experiencing it in in so many different ways, and and a lot of the best holes are actually away from the ocean. They're not necessarily right on the ocean. You know, there's just great terrain there and, and the dunes and how they move and all that sort of stuff. So the diversity of it, um, just in the landscape and how you are able to kind of traverse and, you know, experience that is is one of the things I think that really makes it great. And is, it, it, is it because, so here's a fun question on that point. When you're talking about diversity, right, across the property, you know, I kind of have noticed there's like golf courses maybe that kind of fit that mold in my head a little bit when I'm kind of thinking back to some courses I've played. But it seems to me like when you play those types of courses, it almost feels like it ends before you're ready for it to end. You know what I mean? Like because you haven't been seeing the same thing time and time again, you're kind of like, all right, we've seen this, we've seen this, all right, time to go. But like, is it one of those courses when you're out there to where it just kind of constantly feels like a net new experience because of the diversity. Um, yes, but not, I take it from that, that like, you know, each experience is kind of one upping the last experience. That's not, that's not necessarily good golf though. Good golf is there's a rhythm and flow to how. Um, Eyes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, so at Wickham, for instance, the first five holes are out on, Cape Farewell, which is like this spit of land that like juts sort of north from where the clubhouse is. And then so one, two, three goes around that. Four comes back inland, and there's this small lighthouse there, 157 feet <laughs> adjacent to the golf course. What is it with Michigan guys and always like knowing where the nearest lighthouse is? Because <laughs> we have more lighthouses than any other state in the country. <laughs> we're we're into lighthouses. I can tell. <laughs> 157 feet you knew exactly <laughs> you know it's like it it um nothing against um you know down at harvard town that's a that's a you know it's an iconic thing when they when they're finishing the tournament and there's the lighthouse right yeah this thing dwarfs i mean it's, it's 157 a, feet is a lot it, like it, that's not small. Tower. no building on it it's just a tower i mean it was built in 1861 and i mean i don't know how you know i mean they're these are massive granite blocks that they they quarried nearby and they had a little narrow gauge rail that like brought the blocks down there to build it i mean it's like it's phenomenal from an engineering standpoint um and they built it because there were all these wrecks there because of the bass strait and the winds and the rocks coming through there and you know they had um there was a wreck there 400 and some people died wow and the thing only wrecked like a couple hundred yards from the shore so it tells you how, like, you know, it was really dangerous. So um, it's um, so it, like the diversity of the landscape is there it, that gives you all of these different opportunities to 
to sort of like sometimes you're looking directly at the ocean sometimes it's at your side sometimes you're just right down at the level of the ocean you know and you've got waves you know rolling in on you um um it's overwhelming the first time i saw the site it's overwhelming how you know powerful it is and so the whole key to to building the golf course is like well, you don't have to worry about the spectacle, right? You know, it's going to, people are going to go, holy shit. That's literally what they say the first time they stand there because it is, you know, it's that Have great. you heard of the Rye Club? Yeah. Have you ever been there? Yeah. I was fortunate and got to play it uh, not that long ago. And it's, is it similar to that? Because I got the very, I got a very similar feeling to what you're saying right now, standing out there on the Rye Club, and a very different way than what I, I understand. Like topography and everything is very, very different. But yeah. like it is a overwhelmingly beautiful piece of property, and you just kind of stand there for a minute and go, "Whoa!" <laughs> yeah, that's uh, Rye Scott. You know, it's it feels more intimate though. It's like yes, very and. You know, it's not like Wick. There's nothing around Wickham except for the lighthouse. There's no housing. The closest house is like a couple miles away. I mean, it's like you know, it's in the middle of it's. It's at the edge of the world, sort of, and and it feels that way, right? Yes, and it, it has that. But it's you know, the focus for us was trying to figure out, okay, the rhythm of how you sort of experience. So you the first few holes, you're. Um, you know, you're right on this Cape Farewell, and then you go inland for six through nine, and 10 brings you back to the ocean, 13 brings you back inland, and then you finish, um, you know, 16, 17, 18 on the ocean. But you can always see the ocean in some way or another. Sometimes it's a very, you know, distant kind of feel, but you have this expanse just kind of how it sits out. So, um, trying to figure that out was really more about figuring out the golf and making sure that the golf was really good. And, um, a, a good friend of mine, he was out there early on in the thing. And this is a guy who plays the trans Mississippi and, you know, he's a very good golfer, um, lives in America, but, you know, is, is an Englishman, um, spent over in the States for, um, you know, decades. Um, but you know, he gets around and he understands different types of golf and, and he went there. I didn't know he was going there. I just got this note from him. He said, I knew it was going to be spectacular. I didn't know the golf was going to be that good, you know, which was a, like a high compliment because yeah, focus on it. Like how can he play? And you know, this guy is really good. So, you know, and I think we hit all, I think we hit all the marks there, which is, you know, which is what you're trying to do to, and um, how much dirt did you have to push? Um, not a lot. Um, a lot of it's, um, you know, just incredible natural terrain. And there's, there's area like when you get into sand dunes, um, there are areas where you have to push things to, to make them just calmer, you know, that um, to make it playable. Because right. you, you just, you run into some crazy stuff. The ninth hole, which is this super, it's a way, it's, it's got the highest point on the property, actually. The T is, sits up at the highest point. And you're, you're as far away from the ocean as you possibly can be at that point. And so you can see the ocean in the distance and it's this rollicking par short par five that goes down. Now, if the wind's coming at you, you know, it's three shots to get there. If the wind's with calm forward, or, or it's going forward. Out, no, I have three actually, shots. Me, I'm a short hitter. I'm a short hitter. And I've actually hit a seven iron in once. Oh, hey, I like so, that. Um, I think I made bogey when I did that. Though. <laughs> oh, you hit seven iron then. You know, hey, you gotta you gotta hit the shot. So I had a chance. I had a chance. You tell me no. I had a chance. So, um, um, but there was a big hollow in there that had sort of swirled out, and we sort of had to like you know we had to fill that in. It wasn't it wasn't functional. Um, I don't think anybody would go out there and go, oh, that doesn't look like that belongs though. You know, so right. you know have to literally go there and say you know this 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 was a 20 foot hole um right here you wouldn't you wouldn't think of it that way because it's going around like bigger dunes and stuff and and um you know that's 
that's that's the stuff that's really cool. People think, oh, this is so natural. And it's like, no, I actually had to move a lot of dirt there versus, you know, some other place where they go, oh, I think I see. No, that was exactly the way it was. Mm-hmm. In Kingsley's, um, Kingsley, we only moved about 30,000 yards of dirt total. Really? Yeah. And that, and that, that um, was all that. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, that's number that's one. Incredible. Those, that ridge was there and those mounds and like, we just flatten them off and look, like, that's not dirt moving. That's just shaping, you know, that's just minor shaping. Um, but the 16th hole, um, that green's the most artificial green out there because that was a, that was a big valley, just a little sort of gorge that went through there and we pushed all that dirt and, and you know built the built the green out of that so how how many renditions of nine is there that you drew out and like before you designed that thing like how many times did you go no 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 we missed it we got to redo it again like it, it feels like nine might have taken a few tries at uh, kingsley that was the first green i built actually <laughs> okay I love no no, no, no I, I'm I'm not being no no I like the hole a lot. I yeah, think no, the no. hole is one of no. the best holes out there. No, but I'm, I'm just curious because it's a very interesting par three. Yeah, very interesting. Well, it's a, it's it's the only green we built. It was one one time there. I mean the the concept of the hole was there, and the landform was there, spitting out that little jut of land. Um, and but the thing is, is we were only thinking really oriented from the left the Western tees. And then there, you know, the volcano tee, which is the forward tee from the South. And then the further back, you know, the 162 yard tee, you know, that land was just there. And we're like, well, why don't we just build tees here? Cause it's a really different look. And that's the only par three there's, you know, with five par threes too, that's the only par three that plays South to North in the orientation. So from a pure golf standpoint, you know, if I had to pick one and eliminate one, I would pick the South T orientation because that's very different. And so that's going to play either with the wind or against the wind, basically, with the way that our our normal Northwest or Southwest winds are. So, you know, you get something that, you you know, you got to hit more club and it looks a lot more ferocious because you got the big valley in the middle of it. So it's like all carry to the green from there. So if uh, you're standing on a on a on a piece of land mike and you're you're laying out holes okay you're like kind of going out there doing your thing when you're sitting there thinking about this hole and you're like well i got some runway here and i could do a couple different things and this could be a par four or par five do you actually think about the wind and playing the hole and then kind of maybe let that kind of guide it a little bit as well or is it like well this looks like it should be a par four and we're going to make it a par four regardless of the wind like is there a lot of thought that goes into that kind of like we were talking about with Augusta national earlier, or is that just kind of a happy coincidence? A lot of times. Well, um, again, all of that. <laughs> so, You're very good. You should go into politics, Mike. I'll vote for you. <laughs> Don't want to do that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, it depends. Um, you're trying to more importantly than just that individual hole is how does that hole work with the hole before it, the hole after it, how, what's the rhythm it gets back again to the rhythm and flow of the golf course. And if, if you don't, if you don't have holes that connect together, well, you know, if you have 17 marginal holes that don't connect to each other and you have one greatest hole in the world, you got a crappy golf course. Because it's not just the one hole. So, you know, Cypress Point isn't great because of 16. It's great because of all the other things that work together. And, yeah, that's a highlight for sure. But that's not the reason that, you know, the 16th hole isn't the only reason that it's a great golf course. No. So um, you think about there's, you know, uh, Donald Ross was very prolific and did – you know, in excess of 400 golf courses. And some of them he spent a lot of time at, Pinehurst. Um, the courses up around, you know, Boston and, you know, in Massachusetts where he lived in the summer. And, you know, he was in Pinehurst in the winter. So, um, you know, they, he had a lot of time on site with those. There's more detailing maybe in those things. But 
there are a lot of golf courses that he did. He got around and he imparted a lot of knowledge and wisdom on his people. And some of the stuff, you know, he didn't see much at all. It was a plan and they figured it out. But the interesting thing about a lot of Donald Ross golf courses that I find is that there's this great balance to them and it's very playable and maybe it's not the most spectacular site, but he makes the great use of the land and there's this great balance about it and you got to hit golf shots. Now they're not all Pinehurst number two, but it's always a pretty good test of golf. I think so. I agree a hundred percent. I think Ross's are always, I always feel like you're going to play golf when you go to a Ross. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you're, yeah. you're going to go out there. It's going to be challenging. There's going to be some easy holes. There always seems to be that, but like, there's also going to be a couple really difficult ones. And yeah. like it's, you, you'd kind of know, and that's kind of the cool thing, right? Is like, I think architects in a way all kind of put their, their thumbprint on things. Right. And it's really cool. And I'm sure it would be really awesome to know as much as you do because you've studied it so much. But like going back and kind of figuring out what those signatures are of these architects that have kind of become, you know, legends within the industry. But I mean, that's that's what's really cool, right? Is like you kind of know what to expect when you're going to a die versus a Ross versus a McKenzie. Like it's it's just cool how like to your point, like it fits and it makes sense. But also and not only not only do the holes tie together, but like the portfolio kind of ties together too for the architect. And I always think that's kind of interesting as well. Yeah. And they're, that being said, there's a lot of things that they did that were different. You know, they had different phases of their careers and stuff where um, you can't just totally pigeonhole people into only one, of this style or that style, whether that's bunkers or greens or things like that. But I think when you were talking about, you know, okay, how do you put all those elements together and do that? And, you know, sometimes it's a concerted effort that you're trying to do exactly this or that. Sometimes it just evolves. I think if you're just going through the process and you're there, good things happen. So sometimes that, you know, is purposeful. Sometimes it's like, well, if you're just doing good work, it's going to it's going to work out and you're going to have a good product. And so that's a um, that's a you know, that's a that's a bit different as far as, um, you know, sort of, you know, it's it's not black and white. There's a lot of gray. And how do you get it to where it's where it's more black or more white or whatever, you know, um, that's you know, that's the art of it. That's the thing of, of how do we meld into this? How do we, how do we get it to this position versus that position? And um, how can we excite and engage every level of golfer with that? Because, you know, Mrs. Havocamp is, she's engaged in a certain way. She's trying to make contact. Golly, I'm hot today. So, oh boy. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> um, um, versus, you know, the, the really good player who's trying to hit, you know, trying to hit a certain portion or get to a certain part of the green. So he has a chance at birdie or Eagle or whatever. And so, those, those are really different. Those are really different needs or desires, but so I here's don't a fun know. question talking about exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. 17 at the stadium course, or I'm, I'm sorry, 16 at the stadium course. What do you think? Good hole, bad hole, based off what we're talking about, like playability and people being able to be engaged. And do you think it's a good hole, like the island green? What do you think? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I think it, it's talking, an experience. Talking about for sure. Or 17, the par three. Par three, 17. Par three. Okay. <laughs> They're different holes. I want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. Good deal. <laughs> Not uh, enough coffee yet. <laughs> Um, no, I think it's a good hole. I mean, it's a highlight of the deals. A lot of people are kind of like, oh, that, that's all the golf course is about and everything. Well, it's become this, it's become this thing, right? Right. And should every golf course have an island green? No, shouldn't, you know, I mean that, but you know, that, that was this accident, right? That, that just evolved because there was all this really good sand there that they needed and they were just stealing sand 
And Alice Dye said, well, you know, there's your hole. So, you know, it sort of worked out. Um, that was one of those things that just materialized and sort of, you know, happened. And it happened to be like a great thing. So, you know, it's a short, it's a little nine iron wedge for these guys. And, but the tournament's on the line, there's 20,000 people around it. Um, it's maybe, you know, it's maybe not the greatest piece of architecture as far as like, Oh, it's got this slope or that slope or, or whatever. I mean, but it's, it's got everything in the right elements or the right amount. And I think that the situation makes the whole, I don't think that the yeah. whole makes the situation. Yeah. Cause you could put that, you know, there are other Island greens, yeah. uh, other golf courses, and they might not be at that point and they're not playing that tournament which has a lot of meaning and so <laughs> that heightens it right here's so, another fun question so now we're just going to get you to talk bad about all the holes you didn't design <laughs> so <laughs> that's that's what we really do around here we just discourage <laughs> others so, you're throwing me under the bus again thanks for here we go <laughs> i have a question because i really think arcadia bluffs the original one i think it's a great golf course I don't know that it's a nuts and bolts great golf course, but I think it's a great golf course because I've played it in weather. I've played it when it's calm. I've played it a couple of different ways. I've played it with people who aren't good. I've played it with people who are good. And like at the end of the day, having a meal, looking out on Lake Michigan from their clubhouse and being able to see the golf course in front of you, like that's special. Like that's one of the best meals. Like the food's really not that great. I didn't say that out loud, but like that's a great <laughs> meal just because of what is the scenery, right? Like just got the chef fired. Jeez. Yeah, shoot. <laughs> but like, I mean, it's just I think it's a great golf course because I think people go there. I think it's got one of the most impressive pull-ups to a clubhouse you ever did want to see. Because when you pull up, man, it feels special. Like just with it overlooking the lake and everything the way it does. But I think people go there and have a great golf experience. And I think that's what makes a great golf course. But I know a lot of people don't feel the same way as me and think Arcadia Bluffs is not a great golf course at all. But I'm just curious as to what you're and, and we're not trying to slay, say it's bad or anything, but I'm just curious from an architectural standpoint, what do you think of Arcadia Bluffs? Um, there, well, there there are it is it's an amazing experience, you know, because it's a spectacular vista and all that. Um, and there's some really, really good holes there. And there's some holes there that I don't think are as good just with maybe how they fit in or again, back to the rhythm and flow. You know, I'd like to, I would like to see more ebb and flow in the round. And I think I feel like they're like every hole is trying to one up the last hole. Cause it's, it is so spectacular. Right. And to me, that feels, um, you know, that expectation, that that hype is like, it, you can't sustain that quite, you know. Um, you know, golf, golf takes time. And you have to be, um, you have to be in the moment, but at the same time, you have to be, you have to have a certain amount of patience with golf. And you have to focus on things differently throughout that three to four hours or whatever. I prefer to play in like three hours, not four plus. Um, and so, you know, for different people that that means different things. Um, I think it loses a little bit. Um, not that there's, it's not a great experience, but that um, just from a pure golf standpoint, I think there's some things there that don't, that don't fit together well. There's a bunch of different ways to route the golf course. This is one of the interesting things about it is that because of the crossovers and things like that, like I'm always thinking about the original routing numbers that I have about the, where the routing numbers are now, because they ended up switching like hole eight. And I don't, I can't exactly remember how it is. Um, now that's kind of a cool thing because like if you have a private club and you have a bunch of different ways that you can play, a number of holes like from the clubhouse you know you could you know if you're a member at this club or whatever you could you know let's say you can't you know you don't have time for 18 holes you can go out and you can buzz around and do this or it's late in the day 
and you know you've had a long day and you just like hey i'd really need to just relax and chill out i only got an hour and 15 minutes i could play that four hole loop there you know real easy or that six hole loop or something yeah yeah and you know those things are cool and i think like arcadia has that at the bluffs course and then you contrast that with with the south course which is a really different feel and and style and they've um you know what what dana you know really did there is he took this he took this design style and this concept and this idea and he went 140 percent at it which is cool and it, you know it plays you know the conditioning is phenomenal jim bluck does a great job there and- i think that's some of the best course conditioning i played it a year ago south course i yeah. think it's some of the best course conditioning i've ever seen I honestly yeah. say, I honestly mean that. Yeah. No, it's like, it's hard and pure. The ball's rolling, doing, you know, stuff. I mean, I would never forget. And, that's, it's like a really, it's, it's very different. Those two, those, those two experiences are very different, which is you know, like super successful. They're building the third course now. They're building the 12 hole course right now. So, I mean, I think if you're, if you're, if you have a successful brand, like, and I hate to say that, but, if you have a successful brand like Band and Dunes or like uh, Whistling Straits or like, you know, Arcadia Bluffs, or I don't know what you would call that group now, but Arcadia. Uh, yeah. If if you look at these established brands, dude, build as many golf courses as you can. Bandon's sitting there going, we can only give this guy in Michigan two days at a time. Well, we need to build more properties because he'll buy more than two days. You yeah. know, like, I mean, it makes sense. It's just my fear my fear of it all really is like, and maybe this is not a, a, a rational fear, but it's like, I just hope we don't get to the point where we, and I'm certainly not accusing CDP of this or, or any architect in particular of this, but it's just like, it feels like it's at a race to a $10,000 green fee right now within the industry. Like the first one to get to $10,000 around wins. And like, we're kind of building these monuments to try to create that and like try to create this whole thing. And I'm just a little worried because the South course um, for as an impressive property as it is, you kind of feel like, do they know how good this place is? You know what I mean? Like it's kind of understated and it's not like this mega expensive, crazy ordeal. Uh, And it's just, it's, it's very, very, it's very good. But I'm am concerned, man, because like you said, like, you know, we're going to keep building golf courses. And if we already have the bluffs in the south, well, now we really got to build something spectacular. It's just like, where is the where do we get to where we kind of lose our way? And it feels like it could go that way any moment right now with the greens fees just going one way and one way only. Well, again, golf's a business. So, you know, if there's demand like, you're, you know. Uh, if you're going to, you know, you're going to Bandon and you can only get two days, they're going to charge you whatever they're going to charge you or whatever. Right. Now, that being said, um, what are you golf, doing in Detroit? What are you be, doing in Detroit? Golf, that's, golf that's... Golf have to be expensive. I mean, it, it can be moderate, you know, and it doesn't have to be like, you know, I was, my grandparents were members of Crystal Downs and I was fortunate to like live in the area and you'll be able to experience that and then start working there. But I, yeah. you know, I played the nine hole uh, or the it, um, little, you know, nine hole executive, let's put it. It was like, it was par 32 or 32 or 34. Yeah. Anyway, Frankfurt golf club, which no longer exists, unfortunately, which was like this great place because someone would drop me off they'd they'd pair me up with like other kids some old couple whatever that was great like you got nine holes here and you need to talk to somebody and you need to know how to mark your ball and not walk in their line and do all this stuff that golf is more than just playing the game you know for sure and sometimes you know there wasn't anybody i just played by myself you know yeah and uh you know there are many times like my first birdie ever i was just i was playing solo by myself at frankfurt golf club and it's a, it's a, it's sort of a blind drive up this hill. And then there's a fence cause there's a road there and you have to hit across this little fence down. And there's a, there's a pole there with number seven. And so you can't like actually, depending on where you're at, you can't actually see the green. You just, and I hit it there about four feet and made the putt. Now 
it was my first birdie. Nobody witnessed it. It was still a birdie, you know? So, but you know, I have memories like that, you know, <laughs> I grew up on a part three. It was an 18 hole. Uh, it was like a part three course. It would be an executive course because it had two par fours, but they were like 210 yards. So they weren't really par fours, but like, <laughs> right. So we call it a par four. Just to- Yeah. But same thing, man. Like, you know, the driving range I worked at, which is how I got into the industry when I was like nine or 10, uh, the driving range was right next door to this place. So like I could just kind of bounce back and forth and like really, even as a young person, 10, 11 years old, you're having to more or less kind of deal with people and adults and figure out situations. And I think all that stuff is amazing. And you learn so much from people just by having conversations. So, you know, it's a great way to grow up for sure. My concern isn't so much that look, if, if you have something and people are willing to pay you what you ask for it, then it's worth that. And I'm not trying to say that it's not fair that these golf courses are expensive because they have every right to be expensive. And their overhead is insanely high. So I have no problem with that as long as, and I truly feel this way, uh-huh. if your greens fees for adults to go out and play are over $50 okay, during the week, I feel that kids should play for free. Like, it's just like if you go to an event, if you're going to tra- charge $18 a beer, I don't care because I don't need a beer, but I might need a water. And if you're charging $18 for the beer, I think we could give the water away for free, Mike, you know, like it's just like we need access and like, that's what concerns me. And like, that's what really can makes me kind of like push back a little bit against the private club culture and all of that, because I want young people and like the story you just told, I want other people to have that same experience because it opens you up to a whole world that otherwise you wouldn't be aware of. And right. like, that's the amazing thing. Golf has this amazing transformative power for people that it allows you to do things. I would never growing up, Mike, I would have never told you I would own a business and do the things I'm doing and travel the world. And, but dude, it's all amazing. And it's all because of golf. And I just hope that more people get to have your story and my story. And it's a beautiful story because it's, it's the story of maturity and growing up. And that's what golf kind of forces you to do if you choose to get better at it, because eventually you just have to look in the mirror and go, hey, I'm not as good as I think I am. I need to work on these things and I'm either going to do that and get better or I'm not. And I'm not going to get better. And like, I kind of like the golf at the end of the day as a game. You can either play it or you can't. And I love the fact that like no matter how many access problems we have, if you can shoot 66, they can't keep you away. And I love that about the game. Like, I love that there is a competitive part to it. And it isn't all about like being able to get to the course. I love the fact that if you can play, you can play. And if you can play, then they can't stop you. And I think that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, I work on a lot of um, private, you know, old golf courses and restoration and renovation type stuff and things like that. And most of the time, those are, those are, you know, private, private courses. Um, some of them are semi-private things like that, but a lot of the new stuff I've done, um, you know, Kingsley club's the only one that's like purely a private golf course. Gray walls is semi-private. I mean, there's a big membership up there, but you know, you can pay to play there and stuff. And it's still pretty reasonable there. It's 125, $150, which is great. No problem. Really like a, (laughs) a very, you mean, you don't want to talk about, you know, crazy ground and like really cool stuff. 60 foot granite walls, right. You know, 10 feet off of a green, you'd think, how does that work agronomically? Well, the sun angle and the morning light and the wind and everything. And like, it works. And Craig does an amazing job maintaining it. So it's a very different, you know, um, experience and you can do that. But the three, three golf courses around Grand Rapids are all public. I think the most expensive ones, maybe 80 bucks or something. So perfect. Um, yeah. So, you know, the golf, good golf doesn't have to be doesn't have to be super expensive you can still have good golf if you've got good ground and in michigan we're fortunate because of the glaciers you know they've churned up and there's a lot of sand and there's a lot of good drainage and we have a lot of good clean water so you know we're 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 really you know overly abundant in the things you need to create decent decent golf courses you just have to put a little time into it and, you know, and manage that. And that, you know, so that's a, that's a very fortunate thing to have. So before I run out of time, I am curious, because I know you potentially have a project going on in Detroit. 
Detroit is my favorite city in the world. It's my adopted city. I love it to death. And I'm very excited that you maybe have some news that's going to be very interesting to hear. So I would maybe love to hear a little bit that you can share with us about what maybe is going to happen in Detroit. Well, um, yeah, hopefully this is going to happen. There's a group that is um, that is looking to acquire a parcel and um, and do it. It's not ready for, you know, they've been they've been trying to draw some interest and things like that, you know through social media and all that kind of stuff and um but yeah but hopefully and that's the sort of thing it would be a thing that would have um some public play to it they would have certain types of memberships that would you know it would be sort of a core group that would that you know would be there and you know have different events it's a bit more of the uk or australian type model of membership where you know members have a preference uh you know to times and things like that and they're sort of committed they're like the core of the but it also allows outside play so there's a lot of different ways of of doing that and that's a little you know the typical american one if it's a private course like nobody's allowed in unless you're with a guest or with a member with you know as a guest um um gray walls is a bit different like that you know they have this big membership they have two golf courses there um and so you know, they have, <laughs> we call it the factory because that place does more golf than any other place I've ever, I can ever imagine. And, you know, late June, they're at the far North and West end of the Eastern time zone. They're parking golf carts at quarter to 11 at night. I believe it. Cause they've done like the men's league. They've done 200 rounds after five o'clock <laughs> because, because everyone works the full day and they go out and do their men's league. And like, it's just a zoo. It's just like, <laughs> And so, um, you know, we joke about it. We call it the factory. How's the factory doing? It's like, good, full sheet thing. And so, um, you know, which is awesome. awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. People it's are great. People are playing and they they love their golf and they get out and, um, you know, they're, the UP is, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of people that love the outdoors, whether that's golf, biking, hunting, fishing, um, camping, you know, yeah, everything. I mean, yeah. it, you know, it's, it's full on. So yeah, it's, it's super fun. Well, that's awesome, man. I mean, I, I didn't even get to gray walls and I mean, there's a, a multitude of properties that you've touched and been associated with that we haven't even talked about. And I mean, that kind of speaks to, you know, your commitment to your craft. And when I think of you, I definitely think of a craftsman, you know, and, and I mean that in a very sincere uh compliment kind of way and i think of david the same way like david is one of those guys that can put his hands on something to build you whatever you think of uh and it doesn't matter whether it's metal wood whatever plastic like the man can can make things happen with his hands and you're no different you just happen to need a little assistance with a dozer so um (laughs) so it's i'm a i'm a sculptor uh using a twenty thousand pound machine yeah yeah, I mean, it's it's just super cool, man. And like, there's a there's an artistic integrity, I would say, you know, to what you do. And I would say yep. that David uh, Adele also shares that artistic integrity. And I think that a lot of that integrity stems from trying to do the right thing. And, you know, there's a humbleness, you know, to you and to David and to other people that share this to where kind of what you've alluded to multiple times today Yes, like I would love to sit on that tea box and tell you that I dreamt the whole thing up and it just appeared. But in reality, like I did a lot less than you think I did. Like I tweaked it a little, but like, and that just shows like that that you're not trying to make it about you. You're trying to do what's right for that hole and for that property and for that ownership group. And I just I think that's really refreshing because I think a lot of people go out to put their stamp on things. And don't really care about the shareholders in that situation um, for the most part. So my hat's off, man. I, I think you really do that stuff well. Thanks. Well, I appreciate that. Um, I think, you know, um, you, you talked, you know, at the beginning, you talked about CDP. And so Clayton, Derice and Pont, Mike Clayton, who's in Australia and played the European tour for, you know, 20 plus years and Australia, Asian tours for, you know, in excess to 30 years when they used to have, you know, they had a season in Europe and they had a season back home in Australia. And um, he got into golf architecture 
kind of by he was writing about golf and um he had two two um two guys that were superintendents really good superintendents um john and bruce that you know could execute his sort of concepts and and things like clates has been around golf his whole life growing up caddying and a great amateur player and professional and you know he's the philosopher and then frank's in in the netherlands and frank was a civil engineer and then he was in finance and you know he just he wanted to do what he wanted to do and so he got into into golf and stuff and he grew up on an old an old harry colt course and called einhoven which is like amazing and nobody ever talks about it it's really good and um um you know when we came together about five years ago there's this synergy there that we don't work on everything together but we you know we talk a lot and you know sometimes we work on the same project together or all three of us do um but sometimes it's just like you know i need feedback and i need this you know and you and you get this philosophy that comes from three different sort of experiences in the game but with the same end goal is how do we make the best experience like on a golf course the best golf how do we how do we make that unique and special for that group of people that client or you know just honoring that land and what we do and um that's been the thing that's been um the last couple of years when i've been back down in tasmania so i did wickham 11 years ago but Seven Mile Beach, which is right next to Hobart International Airport, literally 10 minutes away and 25 minutes to downtown Hobart, which is a quarter million people or something in the area. You know, it's this, again, oceanfront dunes, amazing sort of thing. And then doing that with Clates, where I was there every day and Clates was there for two or three days every other week. He's seeing stuff that I'm not, you know, when you see something every day, you kind of like, Ooh, you know, like it does help yeah, seeing, yeah. seeing it evolve. But you also like when you, when you go away and you come back and something's changed and Clates will, you know, see something else. And, you know, it was just a constant refinement to get to the peak of the mountain. Like, okay, yeah. can, how, how do we make this better? How do we squeeze out another 1%, you know, you know, we got an A. I don't, I'm not satisfied with that. I want an A plus. So how do we like, you know, how do we move that up? And that was, you know, that's really cool that, you know, working with those guys and all our other associates and other people, the superintendent that's on the site and the, you know, just the crew, you know, some kid that's got a rake in his hand, like, this is how you got to rake it. This is, this is what we need to do because this is affecting how that, you know, how that seed gets dropped, et cetera, or whatever. And that's awesome. That's all really that stuff is like, you know, every day that just makes every day, you know, the perfect day for me is waking up before the sun rises and getting out of dozer as the sun's coming up and then getting off the dozer when the sun's going down. That's like the ultimate day. <laughs> I hear you, man. I just want to teach golf. I, I want to wake up and teach golf and teach golf. So I can't do it anymore. And I mean, like, yeah. I just think it's because, you know, I like to think that I'm coming from a place of passion with what I do. I, I know that you're coming from a place of passion with what you do. And I, I just think that's what's fun, man. Like when I when I try to pick guests for this podcast, it's not necessarily about name recognition or, or what someone's contribution is. It's just I want to find people who are passionate and kind of share this passion of golf, whatever that means to them. I just want to bring more passionate people together because we all have this, this very strong feeling about golf and it means different things to me than it does to you than it does to the people listening. But that doesn't mean that it's not the greatest thing ever for all of us because it is. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's, what's great. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, well, Hey buddy, you know what? I got some golf that I get to teach. You don't have a dozer to get on today, but you do have a wedding. So you got to make sure you get that hair just perfect for that wedding. So I want to give you plenty of time for that. The fro, the fro will be jamming. I like it, man. I like the fro. It's a good fro. And I mean, look at me. Like, I, I wish I had a little more, but LA looks strong. Hole number five took care of my hair for me. So uh, <laughs> now we don't have any more. So anywho, thank you so much, Mike. I really, really appreciate you sitting down and talking to us, sharing your insights. It's been great. If you 
are really wanting to enjoy some beautiful scenery, please go check out uh, DeVries Designs on uh, social media as well as on his website. Then you can also visit the CDP uh, website as well and see all of the properties that they are associated with. They are truly some of the most magical golf courses in the world and really, really awesome properties because as you heard from Mike himself, there's a lot of care that goes into making sure that your experiences match exactly what you expect. So thanks so much to Mike for taking the time to join us. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe to this podcast and download it. And until next time, keep grinding. Thanks. Appreciate it.